Hello, this is Chris McGrath of TDN, welcoming you to the next instalment of the Life's Work Project, partnering with Keeneland and the University of Kentucky's Nunn Center for Oral History. We're so lucky that some of the most accomplished figures in our business have agreed to share some memories of their lives and careers, and the great horses and horsemen they've encountered. And today we're especially grateful to meet with a real institution of the American turf, Mr. Ted Bassett. When one thinks of Keenan, three things come to mind. Beauty, tradition, and location. Its beauty ranges over a thousand acres, beautifully landscaped, carefully maintained, assuring its status on the National Historic Registry. We think of it as a national equine park and are delighted at the response of visitors from the four corners of the world. Its challenge over 85 years, emphasizing quality over quantity. We talk about beauty and we talk about tradition, but location is equally important. We're located in the very center of the international thoroughbred industry. It's the apex of the thoroughbred industry. When Keenan was first um, really discovered across this, the pond, so to speak, uh, it was Sir Ivor who was sold for 42,000 here that won the Epson and a number of classic races in England and Ireland and France. They created the feeling that an American bred could participate competitively in Europe over the grass turf courses. And this, this was such an exciting time for us. We were like babes in the wood, and in many ways, uh, we did know the difference between a franc and a hot dog. The foreign currencies were just an anathema to us when we tried to collect and translate them into dollars and whatnot. But it began to grow, and the, um, it was not only a vital sort of spark for the thoroughbred industry, and particularly the breeding industry here in Kentucky, but it created an image of Keeneland worldwide of an interesting, intriguing slice of Kentucky. And today now, we're, we're the largest international equine public auction in the world, and we're pleased that our racing uh, in April and October has a number of quality grade one races to present to the public. Bassett presided over a wild boom in the value of yearlings, vividly captured by the famous and symbolic moment when the first ever $10 million bid caused the seven-digit display board above the rostrum to go blank. Well, that, that was when it went from um, one million uh, to 10. And suddenly, uh, here, here you're going along, you're bidding, you're taking the bids, eight and a half million, nine, 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 five, five, nine, eight, up when, when it hit 10, we didn't have the number slots available to the 10 place, and the board went blank. <laughs> you know, it sounds like funny, funny sort of situation today, but uh, at that particular time, it, uh, there was a gas, there was a silence in the entire pavilion. But then we put an additional slot. <laughs> Looking back on those days, it was almost like an adventure movie when we put it on. Uh, people from around the world, those bidding contests were tense and, and the silence in the entire pavilion of listening, you know, and they're taking, I have 10.1, 10.2, 10 and everybody hanging on, and Sankster bidding, Wayne Lucas bidding, and it was like a, it was like a little miniature boxing match, you know, one time and then recovering, and but uh, Lucas got it at 13.2, uh, which was a Najinsky, which uh, was the highest price 
that we have ever sold. I look back on those, I was very fortunate to uh, be a, a minuscule part, a bystander looking on, seeing it. It was like a cast of characters coming in here. The interesting foreigners and the Arabs. When the Arabs came in, that um, I remember we had a call from the Hyatt Hotel and asked us, um, it, were we aware who the um, representative coming from Dubai were? Where is Dubai? <laughs> I mean, we were that sort of uh, uninformed. And uh, they had a hard time getting, uh, they wanted to take over the 12th floor of the Hyatt and their first visit here. And they called the, the local Hyatt said, do you know these people? And I said, no. Uh, well, how do you spell the name? I, M.A. Maktouma. No, I've never heard of him. And uh, <clears throat> at the time, he said, well, they want to take over the whole 12th floor. I said, well, do the best you can. Uh, we, we hope you'd be coming. Well, they balked downtown because they had their own regular um, guests for the July sale, mostly domestic. And then uh, the Montoons had just built this gigantic Hyatt Hotel in Dubai, and they, they got into the Hyatt International, got into that floor opened up. Bassett's family tree had only shallow roots in the world of horses. My grandfather was president of the large bank in Lexington, Fed National Bank, and my father worked at it. And when the depression came and there was a major bank closing across the United States, the Fed National Bank closed. My grandfather was ousted and my father was out of a job. And he got a job working for Major Louis Beard, who was the polo playing partner of Jock Whitney. And Major Beard was a West Point graduate and I came here to run the, the Whitney Farms, and my father went to work there, and then later became the overall manager of the Kentucky operation, and he was on the original board of directors here at Keeneland. So while his father did point the way, Bassett's own turf career, in common with every other aspect of his long life, would take its course according to principles he learned in the Pacific Theater with the Marine Corps. Well, I was a rifle platoon leader in Baker Company, 1st Battalion, 4th Marines. And the 4th Marines were one of the great historic regiments of the Marine Corps. And it, it was just, it was something being part, even though it was a lowly, young, Green, second lieutenant, but I was a rifle platoon leader. And um, we, we were on Okinawa, we were north on Mount Kataki. And uh, <clears throat> it was an early morning patrol that we were on. And uh, we suddenly were ambushed from, we were moving up through a sort of a, a, a little bit of a valley with, and we were ambushed by the Japanese, and um, uh, <clears throat> I was fortunate that, that I was hit. Uh, how in the world I was hit in my hand? Uh, my critics after said, Bass said, you must have been waving your hand up like this in the air at the Japanese. I said, hell, I don't know what the hell I was doing, but I got shot through the hand, and, and I got mortar in my knee. But. Um, I've often thought of it, um, I could have gotten that bullet right there and I've been gone and it was just a fortuitous circumstance that uh, I had a, the Marine, I, the Marine Corps to me was a life-changing experience and uh, serving in that regiment, it made a change and uh, a commitment. I'm not waving a flag, but you, you had a feeling you, you know, how you feeling uh, can do, you know, you had a feeling and 
So in these other little things that I've been involved with, the state police, listen, if I'd gone into the state police as a Yale graduate, I don't think I'd gotten very far. But the thing is um, believing in yourself, not to the point where you're boring everybody about telling how great thou art, but believe in not only just yourself, but believe in your mission. Believe what the job is. Believe graduating. Believe in getting, moving ahead. And two, E, making the effort to do it. Those two things. After the war, there was the demob reward of young married life in New York City. New York after the war was great. I mean, everything, everybody was excited. The theater was good. You had South Pacific. You had wonderful town. You had um, uh, My Fair Lady. You had all, and then the best thing was orchestra seats 660 compared to 250 or 300 today. But those great tunes, and, and New York was so exciting. Fate had bigger plans for Bassett than to be a travelling salesman on the East Coast. And so did Mrs. Bassett. If you marry a Kentucky girl, <laughs> the odds are, if you've got any ability out, you will return home. And that's exactly what happened. I had a good job there and I liked it. But it was getting to be, uh, I was inching up the ladder, and the more you have responsibility, the more you have to travel. You know, I was getting a bigger territory to do, and I was gone, I was gone about 10 days or two weeks out of every month, and Lucy was so alone, and, and Lucy was an um, Arthur Murray dancing instructor. She was a pretty smart Smith graduate. Back in Kentucky, an initial stint as a tobacco farmer left Bassett highly susceptible to an offer of a post with the state police, even if a little political expediency was necessary to work under Governor Chandler. My father-in-law was a, a very staunch Republican and whatnot, so when I went to work for Happy Chandler as a Democrat, he didn't, took a little dim view of the whole thing. I had no political clout. No interest. In fact, um, uh, Pete Wagner uh, from Philadelphia, the Philadelphia family, why he married a Kentucky girl, uh, Lucy Van Meter, and uh, it came. And she was a childhood friend of my wife Lucy, and uh, they, so we were thrown together. And Pete was a police buff, so uh, when Happy was elected governor. Pete became head of the state and did a very, very good job. But he likes the idea of doing it, but the day by day, nitty gritty and putting up with the complaints and whatnot, so it got tiresome. So he came to me. He said, I'm thinking about resigning and moving to my ranch in Wyoming. Would you like to come down there? I said, oh, I don't know anything, but I said, hell, if I can get out of this tobacco field, <laughs> I'll do something. So I said, well, I can't do it until after I house my crop, which would have been about the first week in September. Well, school busing and school segregation, things were rampant in Kentucky at that time. So he went to uh, Happy. And he says, um, I'm, I'm going to replace him and I'd like to offer you. Well, who is it? And he says, um, Ted Bassett. Well, who is that boy? He said, well, he's Gus Gay's son-in-law. Gus Gay's fought me in every election. He's the biggest Republican in Woodford County. What is, he said, what, what? so Pete came back and he said, well, you voted for Happy, then? I said, no, I'm an independent. But get up to Versailles and register as a Democrat. Well, all my family were Republicans. <laughs> Those early days were sort of hit and miss. And 
But God, they were interesting. They were fun. But I didn't go in as head of the state police by any matter of means. No, I was sort of an also ran. The only thing that uh, they offered me at all, and you know, here I was this non-entity, I was zero, was to be director of the Division of Operator Responsibility. That's a <laughs> multi-test thing for drivers. Like, Well, the first thing I did was I went to the legislature the, in Kentucky, every driver's license ended on December 31st of every year. And every of those weeks, you had people wound five blocks around every courthouse trying to get a driver's license. Was to put, and this wasn't original, it was in about eight or nine states. Birth, issuance of driver's license on birth month. So trying to get that passed. And the only way he got it passed was to issue a temporary license for 30 days and you get the same fee you got. Then I put in the point system. That nearly got me fired. Bassett is justly proud of the improvements he introduced to police training. Improvements recognized by J. Edgar Hoover, among others. I went to work on what we call the School of Law Enforcement that we created with uh, Eastern uh, State University. And that is a big, big thing now. It uh, has people from about 28 states coming in and teaches the fundamentals of law and good, you're able to pay now to have um, really accreditable teachers in there. We bring in people from the FBI, Secret Service and things to speak over there. But that was how I met Mr. Hoover, and he was a felt that you ought to, anyhow, he recognized the efforts we were making to help local law enforcement, not just the state police. In joining Keeneland, Bassett rejected a lucrative offer from a rather less august Kentucky institution. John White, who was, who was governor of Kentucky, uh, and started project. And John and I will say today, you know, <clears throat> Bassett, the luckiest thing that ever happened to Kentucky Fried Chicken was that you didn't take the job. I said, now, John, wait a minute. What do you mean by that? He said, anybody stupid enough to turn down a job that paid $100,000 a year and an option to buy 5,000 shares of stock in Kentucky Pride and took a job at Cannon for 30 is not smart enough to run Kentucky Pride chicken. And to this day, whatever he tells that story over and over again, but it's true. <laughs> I would be among the list of missing persons if both in the Kentucky State Police, Keeneland, and the Breeders' Cup, if there hadn't been some innate problem. The Keeneland problem here, it was the, um, it wasn't a personnel problem, so to speak, but suddenly in the, in the um, post-depression years, Lexington began to grow. The interstates, I-65, I-75, opened up both Ohio and Tennessee. Our market began to expand. Lexington was growing at the rate of eight to 10% a year of population. And Keenan was not prepared for this growth. And then there's a combination, too, of, of the survivor opening up the international market for us. So if there hadn't been this sort of, of uh, a float, but a bit of a drift, there would have been no opportunity. I would have been. And the same thing with the state police. The state police, when I went down there in the 60s, the mid-60s, it was, the nation was divided by civil rights, 
not only school busing, open housing and whatnot, but the equal pay, the riots, Watts, Alabama, Detroit, Rochester, uh, created a, 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 there was a, the perception of law enforcement in those days was at a very low ebb. You had Bull O'Connor in Birmingham with police dogs attacking the black mothers and the small children. You had the high pressure water hoses and tear gas turned on these same people. You see the bodies rolling over in the pressure of the hole. The feeling anti-police, police brutality uh, was, was prevalent throughout it. And when I took over the state police, I was trying, morale was at a low, but low ebb, and I was trying to get legislation to increase the salaries, increase the size of the force, uh, concentrate on increased training methods and, and uh, caliber of quality of instruction. What can we do to emphasize that we're more than halt? What can we do to the public? We had little or no money to do it. So I looked at what the positive things the state police were doing. And I went to the Outdoor Advertising Association and I asked them, I made a pitch. I said, would you give us a pro bono billboard and each of our 16 state police posts across the country for 30 days. Would you give us a pull book? Well, yes, what are you going to do, Ben? I said, we'll, we'll develop the billboard. So what we did, this is now the first step of trying to change public perception. The first thing we did, we had this good looking, clean cut, waist high, state trooper with his hat and whatnot. And his hand was not like this, it was like this. And big red letters across the billboard was, it's my job to help you. And then we had the telephone number of the state police post in that particular district. But that was our first step of trying to say, friend, not fool. And I'm just fortunate, fortunate to have had the opportunity. I'm fortunate as hell to have the opportunity to live in this community, to live in something like Central Kentucky. And the, the people, the place, I said this the other night, I was talking to a group Sunday night. I said, you know, we ought to think how fortunate we are to be here, to be in Lexington, be in Central Kentucky. It's not only just the beauty of the place, it's the beauty of the people. The people here in Kentucky and Central Kentucky are caring, caring people, kind people, thoughtful. Bassett was honored to introduce this neighborhood and its community in which he takes such pride to none other than the Queen of England. We had a European re representative in David Hedges who started the International Racing Bureau in London and was well thought of and whatnot. And he, we were still on the early days of the international market. We're just sort of plotting. We hired David to try to help us facilitate the buyers and the people coming. And he came up with this idea. Then we went to Will Farish, as he had played polo over there and uh, knew uh, Prince Charles. So suddenly this, but the real reason that she wanted to come was she, she very knowledgeable about breeding and her own racing operation. But she was interested in seeing the American stallions and the American stud farms. So the Cannon thing fitted in, we were gonna name a race for her and then she'd be able to visit the farms for several days and whatnot. And it was, a, it was a memorable occasion, but she couldn't have been more 
pleasant and thoughtful and kind. And we, we took her, uh, oh, we put her on a fake auction. Did you know that? Well, we put on an auction down there in, in the sales for being. We brought our team in from around the country, the bid spotters and the auctioneer, George, and, uh, and set her there. And then we took, um, oh, eight or ten horses, trying to take something uh, that had some, it didn't make a big difference what we thought. It, some, uh, if uh, we sold one, we start off, we sell one for 50 or 75 thou. And uh, as it went up into the bigger record, we tried to get one that had the white blaze of the yearling that went. We, nobody even knew, but we were trying to be authentic. And then we had a luncheon for her, but so thoughtful and kind and very nice to Lucy and myself since then. We've been invited to Ascot and been invited to um, Windsor and to Buckingham. My only claim to fame, he knows the queen. <laughs> 25 years ago, I wouldn't think I'd go very far today. You all will not believe this, and I'm embarrassed. You can see it over there on that photograph. But one thing, um, when I was head of the World Racing Championship, uh, and we we presented this trophy at Ascot. Um, it was what they said. Now, when the queen, do not be some yahoo American around him putting your hands up like this to try to get it. Wait until the queen presents the trophy to you. Wait. So at this particular time, uh, with the Aga Khan, uh, who is an old pro at this, the queen hands it to him, he gets it, and I'm supposed to be presenting it to him. He's the owner. So somehow he got into it, and the damn thing slipped out of the damn thing. And it's, it's a photograph, it hit the ground and bounced. It hit on my toe. It didn't hurt at all. But three or four weeks later, a little spot sort of developed in there. I said, I better have a doctor look at this. So he went over there and said, well, we better take a biopsy of this thing. So he calls me up and uh, he says, you gotta go in the hospital. We gotta chop that toe off. So it was called the fortuitous drop. Because if I hadn't, if I hadn't gone to, uh, uh, I don't know, what, you know, that the drop didn't cause it. The drop made the nail go a little dark. If I hadn't chopped my toe off, then I probably would have ignored that thing for a long time. I'd have to take my foot off. It was a melanoma. So, so it's called the fortuitous drop. Oh, I've got to tell you this, this thing. Uh, later uh, after that, maybe the following year or something, when I was, um, I asked David Hedges, have you got a photograph of that? Oh no, I don't think so. I think the Queen has got a photograph of that. I don't know. But when, I, when, I, when she invited us to lunch, when I said so, I said, you probably, you probably don't recall the, when I made a fool out of myself on the drop to, oh, I do, I remember it. Well, I have a photograph of it. And that's how I got the photograph of her. The fundamental challenge facing Bassett at Keeneland was to preserve everything most precious to the brand. A sense of heritage, a sense of mission, at a time of radical change, both on the racetrack and in the sales ring. The emphasis should be on service to the industry, service to the country. The emphasis, what we said earlier, on um, tradition, asceticism versus commercialism. And this becomes, 
increasingly dicey as you get new management. There's nothing wrong with it. I, you know, I, I'm a, I would be the classic example of somebody that wanted to change everything, you know, when I came here. Uh, but you have to, on change today, you've got to really understand the reason of Keeneland's what it is. Keeneland is here succeeding because it's different. It makes a difference in the industry. We support many industry uh, issues and things. We try to set the standard. And uh, in the very early days on, on purse distribution, we gave, gave back almost 60% of what we took in, we put back in purses, which no racetrack in the country was doing. So the emphasis has been on purse distribution, which not only helps the trainer and the owner and whatnot, but it sets a standard that you're not just up there gouging, you know, putting something back every single day. One thing, every time a new idea comes along, a new fangled idea, how to improve racing, how to get the fans out here, how to do this, how to do that. And um, it takes some sort of belief again in what you're doing. And I always felt that the answer was flex, not cave. Look at it trying to see what's good that you can adopt and use, but don't cave in and throw everything out that you've done. And this is sort of the challenge as the new administrations come on. They all like these new ideas and want to grasp them in. And what time, oh, they're doing this in New York, or they're doing this in California or whatnot. But the idea of, of beauty, tradition, location sort of keeps intertwining. The purpose of it that we had here was not trying to wring every glass and dollar out, but do it in a pristine way that reflects the traditions of racing. 